must be redefined. I want to talk about success for a minute because success has been misunderstood. First of all, the greatest enemy of success is the fear of failure. Some people are afraid to pursue their success because they believe they might fail. And so they don't try to do something new. Secondly, success is the potential destiny of all created things. Every seed has a tree in it. And the potential success of that tree is in that seed. And that's the way you are. Whatever you were born to do and be is in you now. And the success of your life depends on you becoming all that is trapped inside of you. The third thing about success that's important is to define it. What is success? Here's a definition I thought worked for me for the last 20 years or so. And that is success is the completion and the fulfillment of the original intent or purpose for your existence or why you were created. Success is the completion and the successful fulfillment of the purpose for your existence or why a thing was made. In other words, success is not making a lot of money. Success is not having a big house with a car by a lake. Success is not having a lot of friends and a lot of accolades and a lot of plaques on the wall. Success is really very, very simple. It's you discovering your purpose and then completing it before you die. In other words, success must be measured by why you were created. Success is therefore purpose fulfilled. Success for the next year is going to be you making another step toward fulfilling your purpose in life, why you were born, making another step. And I believe that's why God gave us years, so we could live our lives a year at a time. Success is not measured by what you've done compared to what others have done. And this is very important because sometimes we compete with other people and because we do better than them, we think we are successful. Success is not outbidding or outclassing other people. You can always find somebody less than you, so you think you are successful. Therefore, success should not be measured by what you've done compared to what others have done. Then how do you measure success? Here's how you measure it. Success is measured by what you've done compared to what you should and could have done. Let me say it again. Success is measured by what you've done compared to what you should and could have done. In other words, the only person who knows how successful you are is you and God. I remember one day when I came home from school as a junior high student, I got, I came first in my exam. I, I got the highest grade. And when I got home, I showed my grades to my mother. And my mother looked at the grade and she says, you came first in the class? You beat everybody else? I said, I sure did. I beat everybody else. I said, aren't you happy? I came first. And she looked at my grades and she said, I'm disappointed in you. I said, why? She said, you came first with 69. <laughs> you ain't smart. The other's just dumber. <laughs> in other words, I was measuring my success against other people. She says, she says, you can do better than this. In other words, she was teaching me a lesson that success is not measured by how you compare with other people, but how you compare with what you are capable of doing yourself. And that's what 2004 must be about. It must not be about you trying to beat other people to the punch. As a matter of fact, when you read the Bible, the Bible says the race in God's plan is not to the swift. You don't come first because you are ahead. The race is those who what? Endure to end. They finish what they started. That's success. Purpose, therefore, is the key to success. Finding your purpose and fulfilling it. Now, I want you to write some of these things down about purpose, and this is very important. Here's a statement I found that encouraged me for many years, and that is, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. When you look back at the failures of this year, you know some things didn't go right. You know some things you didn't accomplish. Some of you failed in doing some things you really wanted to do. Your goals were not fulfilled. And some of my goals personally have not been fulfilled. And you can look back and be depressed. But looking behind you doesn't help you for the future. And looking ahead of you 
can really make you afraid because you look at the uncertainty of whether you will succeed. But I come to tell you that what's important tonight is what's within you now. And God has placed in you everything you need to become all you were born to be. And you are carrying it right now. And therefore, the word of God said it so well. It says, unto him who was able to do exceedingly, abundantly above, beyond all you can ever ask or think, according to the power that's working, not in heaven, but he's placed the power inside of you. And that means that whatever you were born to do and become is on the inside of you. Very important to understand that. Can I make this statement about purpose, therefore? Purpose is so powerful, and if you understand it, it becomes personal. Number one, you were created with a purpose and for a purpose. Nobody here is a mistake. Not one person in this planet came here as an experiment. You were not born just to make a living and keep a job and pay bills and then die. You were not born just to, to, to retire and get some pension and then fade away and we put you in a plot somewhere. You were born because there's something God wanted done that required you. You exist because God wanted something to happen on earth that he gave you to do. As a matter of fact, Job 36 says this, and I love this verse, verse 5. It says, God is mighty, but does not despise men. He is mighty and firm in his purpose. That word despise means to ignore. God does not ignore 6.1 billion people on earth right now. Each one of them, God has a specific purpose for them, and he will not despise or ignore them. You were born to do something very critical. Here's my favorite verse in the Bible, Proverbs 1, Proverbs 19, verse 21. It says, many are the plans in your heart, but the Lord's purpose for you will prevail. Say amen. amen. God said, you got many plans for 2004, but before you make plans, consult me for my purpose, he says, because I got a purpose for your life in 2004. There's some things God want done in you in 2004. And that's why you shouldn't just go about making plans without spending time with God. That's why you have to stop and begin the year in his presence like this. Because you ain't smart enough to figure out your future. And God knows your future long before you was created. And therefore, he wants you to know his purpose so your plans can be in keeping with his purpose. What a tragedy to be successful in the wrong thing. It's frightening to be perfectly successful in something God never told you to do. Therefore, the future of your life should be always tapping into God. What did he created me to be? And, and therefore, God says his purpose will prevail. What is purpose? Purpose is defined as the original reason for the existence of a thing. In other words, purpose is why a thing was made. Secondly, purpose is the reason why something was created. In other words, whatever you were born to do is why God created you. You were not born just to live a life and just die. You were born to accomplish something specifically. Matter of fact, success is making it to the end of your purpose. That is success. It's like, it's like a bird trapped in an egg. If that bird never flies, that bird is a failure. It never made it to flight. And that is what success is. Success is not just existing. Success is making it to the end of why you were born. Every banana tree, every mango tree, every apple tree is the end of the seed. And the seed is not successful until it makes it to the tree and has fruit on it. And that's what success is about. It's about fulfilling and completing your purpose in life. I want to talk about purpose and time for a minute. Write this down. Very important. This, this blew my mind some years ago. And that is time was created by God. He put you in it, but he doesn't live in it. What is time? We're talking about one year. Time is defined as an interruption in eternity. In other words, God who lives in forever took a little piece of forever and called it time. And then he put us in it. In other words, time has a beginning and an end and is trapped in forever. In other words, God lives in eternity. Eternity has no measure. It has no, no time in it. It is timeless. As a matter of fact, eternity is time without measure. So God lives in eternity, but he created time, put us in it, and then he gave us time to be lived in days and weeks and months and years. And we're about to change another year, which is 52 weeks, which we have to account for in our lives tonight. And we're about to enter another 52 weeks of our life, and we want to make sure that those 52 weeks are used for what God gave us birth for. Everything is, in, is time without measure in eternity. Now watch this. We were placed in time to fulfill purpose. There's a tremendous understanding of this in the Bible. Purpose gives meaning to life and time. If you don't know your purpose in life, 
your life and time will have no meaning. You'll simply be frustrated and wondering, why am I here? What am I going to do? Why do I hate this job? Why am I going to the same place all the time? And you begin to be frustrated, and your frustration is taken on other people because you don't have any meaning for your life. Whenever somebody commits suicide, they usually leave a note for someone. The note normally says, I had no reason for living. That is the saddest thing in the world. But there are some people who don't commit suicide instantly. They're committing suicide slowly, like taking drugs every day, like drinking alcohol every day. It's what I call slow suicide. They, they can't see something more important than smoking uh, cigarettes or drinking alcohol or taking cocaine or something. In other words, they haven't found something more important than the drug. They're committing suicide. The reason why I don't drink alcohol and I don't smoke is because I found something more important for my life that these things will interrupt with. And so I have to stop whatever stops me from fulfilling my dream. And therefore, when you have a purpose for your life, it disciplines your behavior and chooses your habits. Amen. Purpose gives life meaning. Here's another statement I thought was interesting in the book of Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. One of my favorite verses says, To everything there is a season, and to every purpose there's a time under heaven. In other words, if you are in heaven, it's eternal, there's no time. But when you come below heaven, you now have a purpose that has been fulfilled in time. That means you were born to do something, but you ain't got forever to do it. And therefore, you are on a race between you and your grave. I always tell people my, my greatest motivator is death. When I think about my death, it makes me work hard. And death has been placed in my life as a timing. As a matter of fact, the next verse of that chapter says, there's a time to be born and a time to die. In other words, you got to know that there's a time you're supposed to die and you're supposed to complete your assignment before you die. And if you die before you complete your assignment, you were killed. This is why God says he gave you time to fulfill your purpose. Look at verse 10. It says, I have seen the burden God has placed upon all men. And that burden is he has made everything beautiful in this time. The word beautiful there means matured. He gives you time to fulfill and mature everything that you were created to do. In other words, whatever you were born to do, you were given the right amount of time to do it in. Now, there are some people living on overtime right now because you haven't found your purpose and God has given you grace. You remember that there was a man who actually lived his fulfillment of his purpose and God told him it's time to die. His name was Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, God met in person. God said, Hezekiah, you've done what you're supposed to do. It's time to die. Hezekiah argued with God. He must have been from the Bahamas. He said, God, I don't want to die now. I don't want to die now. I want to live long. God says, no, you must die now. He says, no, I don't want to die now. Give me some more years. And he begged God, and God gave him 15 extra years. In those 15 extra years, he gave birth to some of the worst kings of Israel. Tell your neighbor, die when you're supposed to. When you pass your time, you begin to do foolishness. That's why it's important for you to find your purpose and maximize the use of your time for the glory of God. Now, here's something I thought was interesting, too. He also says this statement. It says, And the Lord also has set eternity in their hearts of every man, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Now, this is a very important statement. Let me explain what it means. It says, God took you out of eternity and put you in time. In other words, your spirit is an eternal spirit that came to this earth with an eternal purpose but God trapped it in a body in time. That means you are literally an eternal spirit in a timed body. That's a problem. Now, look at this verse again. It also says, he has done something that you cannot fathom. Now, what is it? What he has done from the beginning to end. In other words, God took the beginning of your life and the end of your life and put them both in a body and put it in time. So you came to earth with your beginning and your end inside of you now. This is very important. That means your future is not ahead of you. We keep thinking we're going to our future. And that's why we keep depending on people, depending on relationships, depending on connections. But your future is not ahead of you in other people's favor. Your future is trapped inside of you, and you are carrying your own raw material. 
And that is why your future does not depend on your external environment. Sometimes you are with people who don't like you. That's okay. Because as long as you like you, what's inside of you will bring you through. <laughs> Write this down, please. The purpose for time. Very important. The value of life is not in its duration, but its donation. You are not important because of how long you live. You are important because of how effective you live. And most people are so concerned about growing old rather than being effective. The people who have impacted the world didn't live long. Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy. I mean, these people who impact the world were not old people. But they lived so effectively that we cannot erase them from history. The oldest man in the Bible is Methuselah. He lived to be six. 960, 600, 969 years. What a guy. And the only thing the Bible says about him is he died. I would love to borrow some of his years. What, what would I do with his years? Some people just want to live long. No, it's how effective you live. My challenge to you tonight is to make 2004 look like five years. Decide to do so much in this year with so much focus and concentration that people are going to think that you lived five years in one year. And that can happen if you decide to follow God's purpose for your life. Don't waste any time in 2004. Choose friends that will help you get to your goal. Read books that will take you to your destiny. And eat things that will keep your body in shape to get there. Say amen anyhow. There are some friends you have to drop at 12 midnight tonight if you're going to make it to your dream. And there are some new friends you got to associate with to get to your destination. Because your future is not ahead of you. It's inside of you. Write this down. Time is divided into days, weeks, and years so that we can live life in doses. God is so good. God gave you the joy of living life a day at a time. The Bible says... This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in that day and be glad in it. Now we have 365 days already gone, and we can thank God that we did something, but hopefully you can live a better use of your days in 2004. God gave us years so we can end and begin in life. That's why he gave us years, so we can end life and begin again. Time was given to us to provide closure to failure and success. Please write that down. This is very important to understand. Some of you have done poorly in 2003. You've really messed up in 2003. You, you did some dumb things. Well, this moment gives you an opportunity to bring closure to that. Some of you lost your sanity and lost your virginity. Some of you lost your business and lost your sense. But now you can bring closure to it tonight and say, that was last year. Say amen. amen. I was a fool last year, but now this year I'm going to be a wise person. In other words, years bring privilege of closure. Also, you notice I said it brings closure for success also. Because even if you succeeded in this past year, you should not live on those successes. Why? The greatest enemy of progress is your last success. You can be so impressed by what you've done in 2003 that you don't do anything in 2004. And you just as much of a failure if you don't do what you could do because of what you did. Don't let your success in 2003 prevent your new successes in 2004. Tell your neighbor, you ain't seen nothing yet. Come on, shake yourself. Say, you ain't seen me yet. Tell your neighbor, 2004, I'm going to reveal more. In other words, we want to see more of you before you die. Give God a hand. We will see it, won't we? We're going to see it. What's the future of purpose? Now, purpose has a future in it already. Write this down. The future of all creation is hidden in creation. Flight is trapped in birds and swim is flapped, trapped in fish. Trees are trapped in seeds. A cow is trapped in a calf. Everything that God created, he put in it what it's supposed to become. In other words, the future of a seed is not outside the seed, it's in the seed. And so it is with you. 
Whatever you were born to do is already trapped in you. The future existed before the present. <laughs> this is very important. Now, why am I so confident as a man? Why am I so confident as a human being? What makes me so confident is that one statement right there. If you want to face the future with confidence, you got to be convicted in your heart that your future is actually God's past. Oh, help me explain this. In other words, no manufacturer makes a product without finishing it first. <laughs> Before Ford Motor Company creates a car, it finishes it first. It designs it, completes it, all the engineering drawings, everything is set, and when it's finished, then they start it. In other words, they present the future first, then they go back and create the present. Now listen carefully now. Whatever you were born to do, God finished first. When God decided what he wanted you to become, then he decided, let me start you. So your future existed before your present. Your present is carrying the future every day. And that's why you shouldn't worry about 2004 at all. Because 2004 is just another strip of time to reveal what's already in you that's already God's past, which you call your future. Amen. You'll get it some other time. In other words, the future is unmanifested purpose. The future is a product of a product is the manufacturer's past. God is not wondering about your success in 2004. He already lived your year for you. There's a verse of scripture in the Bible that's incredible. Can you turn to it, please? Psalm 139. When I was 15 years old, this verse changed my life in high school. Psalm 139, verse 14 says, When I was hid in the depths of the, dirt of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. The next verse says, And all the days of my life. Now, the, the verse before that says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, Marvelous are the works of your hands, O Lord, for my soul knows this. The next verse says, And all the days of my life were written in your book before any of them came to be. Did you all hear what I just said? That's Psalm 139, 14 and 15. It says, I have written your entire life in a book before they began. The next verse says, And if I was to count your thoughts about me, O oh Lord, it would be so amazing. It would be as if I'm attempting to count the sands on the seashore. In other words, God has some things planned for you that if he told you all of them, it will blow your mind. Your future is far better than what you're doing right now. God's book for your life is already finished. You're in chapter 1. Some of you are in chapter 3. 2004 is simply a chapter in the book. What you've got to do is to uh, contact the author to find out what's supposed to happen in this chapter. Can I hear an amen? You are not just here to live another 365 days. You are here to accomplish some specific things this year that God already planned for your life that's already finished. What's good about this is that the future is unreleased destiny. Your future is your destiny trapped inside. The future is your predestination. The future is God's past for your life. Let me quote a scripture that I thought was interesting that may help you with this. Because the future is the end trapped in the beginning. Let me prove that from the Bible. It says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, an interesting statement. Please turn to that chapter. And I want to make these comments about the future. Your future is not ahead of you, but it is trapped within you. You possess your future now, not tomorrow. Thirdly, God is committed to the future he placed in your present. How can you be confident about making it through 2004? No, no problem, because God is committed to his own investment. Some of you are wondering how you're going to make it to the end of 2004 with all your bills paid, all your needs met, and everything that you need provided. 
I am here to tell you good news. The God who gave you that future already is committed to it. <laughs> when God told Moses to go to the turn of Israel in Egypt and tell them he's going to let them come out of there, he didn't tell them how he's going to pay for it and, and finance that. But he told Moses, we're going to bring them out. And Moses went and told Pharaoh, God says, I must come and get the people. And God says, well, Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, let him go. And God didn't tell Moses how he was going to get the money to finance over a million people in that desert. But do you know that before they came out, God waited until the last night. And in one night, God, the Bible says, caused the Egyptians to be favorable toward the Israelites. And they gave them all their gold and silver and trinkets and glass and diamonds and all the wealth and all the food and all the donkeys. In other words, in one night, God financed the whole trip. God's going to do that for you in 2004. Some of you are trying to figure out, how is it going to happen? God is going to finance your investment that he put in your life because he is committed to his future he put inside your life. Don't worry about tuition payment. Don't worry about paying off your house bills. Don't worry about buying a piece of property. Why? You will get it. Why? Because if it's God's vision for your life, the provisions is already in 2004. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, my source is God, and my resource is waiting for me. Let me tell you, 2004 has so much wealth for you, it's waiting for you to get there. I'm going to say it again. 2004 has so much wealth for you, it is waiting for you to get into 2004. Matter of fact, by January or May or April or September, some of you are going to have a history of a testimony that you couldn't believe was going to happen in 2004. Some of the best things are going to happen to you in 2004. There are some things that you've been praying for all this year that God says no. Why? Because that gift is for 2004. You're going to get some answers you've been waiting on in 2003, in 2004. And that's why God had you wait sometimes. Because what you're supposed to have is not supposed to be in that certain year you're asking for it. There's a time for every purpose under heaven. I heard a word tonight, and that is a big open door in 2004. I felt an amen in my spirit on that. There's some big doors about to open for you in this coming year. Very important. Write this down, please. Your future is more important than your past. Thank God. Because our past many times don't look too good. The reason why it's good to see you in this place tonight. Some of you haven't been in this place for many, many days and months. But I'm glad you're here. Why? Because here's not a chance for you to start again. You can start again. And the race is not to the swift. So don't try and compete with nobody here. Get back in the race God gave you to run. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? Run your own race. Your race is against your own death. Finding out your purpose and fulfilling it in God. Write this down, please. Your future is more valuable than your past. Some of us are so committed to our past failures, we ain't got no time to move into the future. What a tragedy. I am convinced that your future is more powerful than your past. Why? Because your future is unlived. You can do more with your future than you can with your past. You can't do nothing with your past. So the power in your life is really in your future. And 2004 is more powerful than 2003 because 2003 is fixed. It's frozen. You can't touch it. All the stuff you've done that you're not pleased with is already history. Thank God for a new year. Can I hear an amen? amen? Very important. Jesus died to forgive your past, but he also died to salvage your future. Jesus did not die for you to relive your past. He died for you to start living your future. He died because of the investment that's still inside of you. Psalm 57, verse 2, I love it. It says, I cried to God most high, to God who fulfills this purpose, his purpose for me. I love that. He sends forth from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who haughtily pursue me. What a verse. David says, I cried to the God of heaven who fulfills his purpose for me. He will fulfill 
his purpose that he has for my life. He will fulfill means that you ain't got to come up with no ingenuity to try to figure it out. Half of the things you think you got to work so hard for, God's going to give you as a gift. And half of the things you think are going to be a gift, God's going to make you work for it. <laughs> he has a way to get his purpose to you. Now, what's good about this verse is you ain't got to worry about failure because you cannot fail if God is working out his own purpose for your life. Can I hear an amen? Your future in 2004 is not dependent on President Bush's decision. Not dependent on Iran or Iraq or the oil cartel. It's not dependent on the economy or tourism. It's dependent on the God who is working out his purpose for you. And God owns the whole planet. He can shift things, move people, and rearrange things for you just to bring past his purpose for your life. And I believe he's going to do it in Jesus' name. I say I believe God's about to shift some things, rearrange some things, and no one can stop what God's about to do for you. That means even if they say it ain't supposed to happen, it's going to happen because God is working out things just for you. It's going to happen. You can face the future with confidence without fear, knowing that God does not lie. Jeremiah 15, 11 says, The Lord said this, Surely I will deliver you for a good purpose. Wow, I love it. Surely I will make your enemies plead with you in times of disaster and times of distress. In other words, when folks come against you in 2004, God already got you covered, and he's going to make them become your friends even though they don't like you. He's going to cause your enemies to support you and finance your future. You might as well get ready for a good time in 2004. I see an open door in 2004. Am I talking to somebody here today? Wherever you are, there is a future for your life, and it's already God's history. God's not wondering about your future. Listen to me, friends, and write this down. The past is a portion of your future lived. That's all it is. It's not your life. Stop considering your past your life. It's not your life. It's only a piece of your future you lived already. The big part of it is still unlived. And therefore, 2004 is another opportunity for you to live a real chunk of your true future with no foolishness in it. Amen. Everybody say minimize foolishness. Minimize. Maximize wisdom. Maximize. This is the year for you to make as many right decisions as possible. Sometimes we wanted to get married in 2003 and God stopped you. Some of you have been praying for a spouse for 2003 and God said, mm -mm, if I bring them now, you are a mess. Let me protect them from you. Sometimes you pursue somebody and God won't allow them to like you. You know why? He protecting them from you. But if this year is your year, 2004, for you to be blessed with a spouse, believe me, friends, you are going to walk up the aisle in God's name. Why? He will fulfill his purpose for you. You better lift your hand and thank God somebody. Some of you are nervous to believe that stuff. The past is dead except for the life you give it. Write that down, please. Your past is dead. The only way your past can affect you is if you give it life. And you give it life by thinking about it and by reliving it and talking about it all the time. I like what the Bible says, forgetting the things that are behind, press toward the mark. You cannot go to your future if you live in the past. The worst way to drive is looking in the rearview mirror. And most people live that way. They live staring in this rearview mirror. As we bring this year to a close, this is the greatest moment that you have. You cannot change the past, but you could create a new future. You cannot change the past. You could create a new future. 2004 gives us hope. It gives us hope. I don't know what you've done in 2003 that makes you very, very sad. Some goals you had that didn't come to pass, even some good ones, just didn't happen. Close your Bibles. I want you to take that pass right now. Young people, you maybe didn't go to school, or maybe you dropped out of school, or maybe you have to sit out of school this semester, and you're wondering if God is still with you. Maybe the house you wanted to build, you didn't quite get it built. Maybe that business you wanted to start didn't quite happen. I, I don't know what it is, but don't let the past keep you back from 2004. 
Maybe your relationship was not the best and you want to try again. You want to start again. I, the Holy Spirit is here right now. The Holy Spirit is an eternal spirit that lives in time. He lives with us. He knows how we feel. Let's bow our heads together and let these moments, 30 seconds before 12 o'clock in this country, will bury 2003 right now. And wherever you are, will you go ahead and begin to pray right now and thank God that your past is gone. All of the failures, everything that you have failed in is gone. And that's good. Thank God. The things you've said to your spouse that wasn't right, it's gone. That was last year. In the name of Jesus, I release the past right now at 12 midnight. In our life, 2003 is history. Holy Spirit, take away the guilt. We leave it in 2003. Take away the regrets. We leave them in 2003. Take away the spirit of failure. We leave them in 2003. We step over now into a new life. Welcome to a new year. I want you to lift your hands and begin to worship God right now. Let the year meet you worshiping. Hallelujah. Open your mouth. Just give him thanks right now. Let the year meet you worshiping. Everybody, lift your hands. You never did it before. Lift it up. Let the year meet you worshiping Jehovah. Come sing us. Let's bless the Lord. Come on, worship God. Let this year meet you worshiping. Worshiping. The history of 2003 is gone behind you. Students, thank God for a new school year that you will be an A student. Find God, husband, you'll be the best husband you've ever been. This new year, wife, you'll be the best wife you've ever been in 2004. Welcome, businesswoman, businessman, to a level of business you never had before. Welcome, teacher, to the best classroom you've ever taught. Welcome, you businessmen, for the most important investment you've ever made, a new beginning. Worship God. Let this year begin with worship. 